You're listening to the Golden Heart Wedding Photography Podcast. We're your hosts, Lindsay and Michelle. Our mission is to connect creatives, learn from one another, and grow together as a community. In today's episode, we chat to Kobus from Kobus Tolog Photography. We talk about staying relevant in the industry, marketing yourself and growing your business, and how he uses his platform to educate other photographers. With that said, let's get right into it. Hey guys, welcome to our next episode. We are so excited to have you all here on our Wedding Photography Podcast. Today we are speaking to one of the legends in our industry. We are so excited to have him with us, Kobus Tolach. Thank you so much for being with us. We're so excited to speak to you and just learn more about your career and you know, just what you've been doing for our industry. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate this and um, it's an honor. I wouldn't call myself a legend yet, but thank you for the compliment. <laughs> Um, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here and I'm looking forward to having a chat with you guys. So let's dive right in. I mean, Kubis, why don't you tell us a bit about yourself and how you got started in the photography industry? Um, I'll give you the shorter version. Um, basically, I always had a love for photography, um, especially nature. And um, as a small kid, I was really blessed to be able to go to the Kruger National Park every year. And I used to take my mom's camera and photograph but uh, my dad never bought me a camera. He said, one day when I'm an adult and have my own money, I can buy a camera. Needless to say, um, about, you know, at the age of, I think it was 26, 27, I can't remember, I went to Pilonsburg, um with a couple of friends. A friend had a brand new Fuji camera there, and at, on our way there, um, he unboxed it in the in the car. I took it out, asked him, sort of, can I have a look? And he said, yeah, sure. And he never saw his camera again that day. I took all the photos. And about two weeks later, I bought my first camera. And I must say, there was about a space of 15 years. I never took photos. I had twin brothers. So the Kruger trips stopped because um, twins, as well as myself and a sister, didn't work in a combi in the Kruger in summer. So <laughs> Especially there was no uh, air conditioning. So, um, yeah, and then I got involved in uh, uh, wildlife photography for quite a time and it was just a hobby. And I think like most other wedding photographers got asked by a friend to photograph their wedding and then another and another. And then basically one day I went to a meetup in Cape Town where a bunch of photographers were there and there was a speaker. I can actually mention her name, uh, Christine Mainties. And um, she and her husband spoke to us. It was, I think it was about 40 people. And that was 12 years ago, I think, 12, 13 years ago. And when I walked out of that meeting, that was it for me. As I drove home, I just knew this is what I wanted to do. And I started YouTubing, Googling, and yeah, the rest was history. Um, yeah, that's amazing. And Kubis, so how long have you been shooting for now? Um, around about 11 years, I would say. Um, yeah, so I've been full-time 13 years and trying my luck at a bit of landscape and wildlife photography and then moving into um, wedding photography for about, I would say, 11 years. Okay, amazing. What were you doing before that? Were you doing um, landscape and wildlife photography full-time or...? So landscape and wildlife photography was more a hobby of mine. Um, there was a time that I hoped that I could do it full time, um, but I was actually in the construction okay. industry. So I worked for my dad and was in construction for almost seven years and um, was his project manager. Um, and in that time, I basically did wildlife and landscape photography as a hobby. And then obviously, as I said, moved over to to wedding photography. Do you feel that there were any skills that you learned in project management and construction that you've taken into your photography business? I've never had that question before. <laughs> um, yeah, I would say working with people um, because you work on, with people on a daily basis um, on a construction site, um, even though the circumstances are quite, quite a bit different. Um, but there was times that I had quite a few people under me or working with them and and building relations and having to defuse situations. Um, so, yeah, I think there's parts of it that helped and got a bit of business skills from my dad 
and that I learned over the years that would then obviously help me with the wedding photography business side. Awesome. And so you've been shooting for over 11 years now and trends have come and go and we, I mean, being on Instagram, you see, you see all the trends. How do you maintain such a consistent high quality and high level of work? Lindsay, thank you very much for the compliment. I appreciate it. Um, I think staying with the trends and staying current and trying to maintain a high standard is something that is dear to me and I try my best to to stay with it. And basically the way I do it is to look at a lot of photographs. So I look at at least 500 to 1,000 photos a week, wow. um, you know, of over overseas people. So I scroll on Instagram every single morning and look at people from Europe, look at people from America, and then see what is happening on that side. And this morning even, I found a photographer um, whom I like. I can't remember the name. I just took a screen shot because I didn't really have time to like really dive into it but I could immediately see something new and different which I really like and I want to investigate that and maybe in the next week or two or three I'll investigate um, that person's work and and see whether I feel that it might become a trend and then I'll look for people other people that will also have that sort of trend um, or you know, bits and pieces of that, and then see if it actually flows into something. Um, I think one trend that is starting to surface again, um, in my opinion, is that I think the more um, timeless, you know, the timeless feel of photography, the timeless type of editing is coming back into the market quite a bit, um, slowly but surely. Um, but I can see it yeah. quite a bit in Europe happening. Um, you know, it's moving away again from certain colors and 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 palettes, if I can call it that. And it and it's exciting. Um, it's not always easy to stay with it. You guys, I mean, are brilliant photographers yourself, and um, you also stay with the trends and you know try to grind it out to to not fall behind, if I can call it that. I guess there's always the the question um, with staying with the trends is. Are our clients staying with the trends and will our clients in the South African market be appreciating the international trends? Because I know myself as well, there's some trends that I've seen and I'm very inspired by them. But I often look, I'm like, will my clients appreciate that? Will it be consistent with my style? Or how do I tie this mm. into my style mm. now? And, yeah. you know, and how do we stay consistent while introducing new styles? Yeah, it's a very valid point. I think that's definitely something that needs to be taken into account. I mean, I know that the um, some of the Asian styles in Indonesia, Hong Kong, and so they use a lot of off-camera flash versus I think in Russia, for example, I see a lot of work also with flash, but then also using um, methods that sort of, you know, you've got smooth skins and, and it almost looks almost animated, if yes. I can call it that, or like computer CGI. Um, and those markets will maybe not work over here um, or those kind of photos or editing um, or way of shooting. Whereas I think South Africa dominantly is a natural light market where there is still off-camera flash um, photographers and they're great and they have their clients. But I think the bigger pool of clients likes natural light photography, more natural looking um, photographs. And then the whole big word in the wedding industry worldwide is the whole documentary field of weddings. I wanted to touch on what you were speaking about, gathering inspiration and getting inspired by all these photographers. Um, and I think we all know that there's a very fine line between inspiration and comparison. And often, I know I've gone through seasons where I've looked at amazing photographers' work, and instead of being inspired, I feel almost de demotivated. Like, how am I going to get to this level? Or why is my work not like this? What, in your opinion, is the key to being inspired rather than to be demotivated and from comparison? That's a really, really tough one. <laughs> um, I think because we all artists, we all have a passion um, to grow and be the best and then also put food on the table. In the wedding industry, 
Um, offense can be one thing. Jealousy could be another. And also just, uh, let's call it self-worth um, and, and self-belief of where you're going and so on. And um, I, I try to, to rather become friends and, and share ideas with each other rather than being threatened um, by that person. I mean, I can easily feel threatened by the two of you if you come and shoot a couple of weddings in Cape Town feeling that you're going to take my market or me going to shoot in Johannesburg or Pretoria and you guys feel that I'm taking your clients. Um, rather, you know, point clients to each other and and help each other that way and build a network because the full circle always turns. Um, and, and it, yeah, so I feel like you know, looking at other people's work is a good thing. Um, but if it sort of makes you anxious or it makes you jealous or it gives you a negative attitude towards them, then uh, it's something that you should maybe avoid. Um, I know, f for example, a, a photographer a while ago, about two, three years ago, said on YouTube, and, and it stuck with me that, Remember, every single photographer out there has a skill and look for their skill. Um, look for their talent. It might not be your taste. If somebody uses an off-camera flash and oversaturate the image, look at that skill, especially if it's a successful one, because there might be a photographer out there whose work you absolutely hate is a very strong word, but you really don't like their work. But look at what they do to be successful and learn from that. Because you don't have to like their style. You don't have to like their photography. But they're still successful and they're getting clients. And look at how they do that and learn from that. Um, so try to always learn from people, even though you might not think they're good photographers or so forth. Yeah, I really like what you said. And one thing that you said that kind of stood out to me was we are a community and it's better to refer someone than to feel like you're a competition. And the reason why I want to circle back to that is when I started out, Gobas, you were a huge inspiration for me and you were someone that really took up a mentorship role in my business. I felt like when I started out, you sure. were the person Thanks. that I ran to when I needed anything or when I wanted to know anything. So, I mean, you really helped me. Thank you very much. No, thank you. And I feel like it's <laughs> awesome to be able to have someone like that. And I've noticed that you've really taken on that role in so many people's lives so i want you just to tell us why you decided to be a mentor to people what has inspired you to teach and you're yeah, just in a world where competition is so real how did you manage to really just be a community to so many people well before i say that uh, michelle I, I just want to commend you as well because you not say that i've helped you but i mean you've been in the business quite a few years now and um, you've also come to a point where you help me in my business and, and give me tips on a couple of things. So I think, and, and that sort of concludes the whole thing actually because I helped you for a while and you've now helped me quite a few times and it, so it, it's sort of come back to me if, oh, yeah. if that makes sense. Um, and, and, and that's the beautiful part of it is that it, can come back. So the reason I share and want to help photographers is because I think I just want to give back that was given to me. I never studied photography. I, I learned everything off, off YouTube. And I must say back in the day, 11, 12 years ago, when I started Googling things about wedding photography and off-camera flash and all kinds of goodies that I wanted to know, um, there wasn't that much information. Um the information was limited, and if you really wanted information, you had to pay for it. But there was one thing that stuck with me, a guy called Ryan Brenizer. I don't know if you guys have heard of the Brenizer method. Now, the Brenizer method is basically, he takes a f1.4 lens, let's say it's an 85 mil lens, f1.4. He takes about 20 photographs that he pans freehand, and, and then he stitches it together, and you get this big landscape shot, and it turns out to be like under f1. So it's like a a very shallow depth of field on a wide angle. But any case, um, so they had an interview with him and asked him, but why did you share this method with everyone? Um, because you were unique in that. You were the only one who did that. And um, he said to them, if I kept it to myself, some people would have figured it out anyways because people out there 
there are clever. And it would have been called Wide Aperture Pano Stitch. He says, but today, because I shared it, it's named after me. It's called the Brenizer Method. And it's in the whole world, it's known as the Brenizer Method. And um, I feel like I just want to give back and, and help people. Um, last week, I had a live Q&A with a photographer whom I helped two years ago and walked the road with her for, for, for two years. And to see where she is at in her business today, it gives me an absolute kick. I just love it. Um, I mean, we've cried together. We've laughed together. And to see them grow is amazing. Um, do everyone grow? Not always. For example, I did a flash workshop a couple of years ago, teach people all about off-camera flash and so forth. And then I give them actually the opportunity to, for two weeks after the workshop, contact me and ask me questions while they practice what they've learned and then ask me if they have some trouble. So they've got two weeks to email me, ask me questions. And I can tell you out of seven or eight workshops I've done, I think one person used that opportunity to contact me within two weeks. So I've got so much respect for the people that actually takes it and run with it. And and I've got loads of time for those people. And I think on top of all that, I'm a people's person. I just love people and I like helping people. Um, it fuels me, to be quite honest. <laughs> yeah, the fact that you actually share your knowledge is so special. And from someone who really did... Um, like get knowledge from you. I really just want to say thank you so much on behalf of the whole community because I really know that the, the knowledge that you imparted into my life has significantly helped me in my business. And um, yeah, so thank you, Kovis. You are awesome. And um, yeah, it's been a privilege to know you. And I really hope mm -hmm. that so many more people can learn from you and do take up the opportunity to learn from you. And I just also want to touch on one other thing that you said is that you're such a people person. And I can really say that this is so true. So I wanted to ask you about one thing that you've also told me about about how you communicate with people so you've told me so many times that you are such a good communicator at weddings and that you are able to really just speak to people at weddings in such a way that you manage to get more clients so I think the phrase that I will use is you book more weddings at weddings so I just wanted to touch on that have you speak about your way of approaching weddings and just how you communicate with clients and just other people at weddings I actually made a YouTube video about it. Um, it's actually called Booking More Weddings at Weddings. But um, for me, I like building relationships. So I try to become your friend at a wedding. So whether it's a bridesmaid, a groomsman, um, just a guest at the wedding, um, I will actually literally just, you know, walk up to people, take a photo of them and see how they react. And you can buy reading their body language actually see whether they're open for conversation some people are shy and they don't want to and i then respect that and sort of avoid that person not to be noted that sounds nasty but um at the end of the day i really spend time with the people and i try to always get to know like two or three or four couples at a wedding and really invest time in them on the day and take photographs and make sure the bride and groom gets it because it's hopefully they'll then pass it on to that couple and um a few weekends ago the same thing happens i photographed the wedding i met a couple at the wedding i guide with them i joked with them took a photo of them and i actually yesterday got an inquiry from them and and i would do simple things and i this morning got sent a video of um, a wedding i did last weekend and the bride sent me a little video that one of the guests made where they are doing the garter toss and on the video you can actually see me and i'm gonna make a in little instagram post at some point about it um but you can see me walking to the mc and then but you can't hear obviously because it's in a distance you just see me on the side walking to the mc as the bride gets on the chair and then i keep on photographing and you see the mc walking towards the bride and what i basically told the mc is please go stand by the bride I don't want her to fall off the chair. So just to support her. So things like that, because people see that, even if it's just the MC um, or the bride. If, for example, um, when the bride got off the chair, I took the chair and took it off the dance floor. So I don't know who's seeing that. Maybe just the mom of the bride or, or another couple keeping an eye on me and seeing how I... But I think... 
at the end of the day, I, there's one big thing. I want the bride and groom to contact me afterwards and say, we absolutely loved you on the day. And we're getting messages from our guests saying, you made it such a lucky day. Um, and if you can do that in your photography, you'll have a long, consistent business. Oh, that's great. Um, I think that's such an important part is that your our job as photographers is not just delivering photos. And this is something we spoke about in the last episode mm -hmm. was that we're also there to serve our clients and we're there to make their day the Definitely. best day in whatever yes. way we can. Um, but I actually mm -hmm. wanted to, to touch yeah. on, you, you said you are very intentional with being friendly and meeting people at weddings. And I guess a lot of it would come naturally. Like you just seem like a nice guy. So I think being a nice person is probably <laughs> coming naturally. And, you know, you probably maybe weren't thinking this is going to be good for my business to tell the MC to go get this chair. That probably is a, a, a side effect of being a nice person. But how much of your connections and your networking at weddings is intentional to the point of, you know, like, are you going to go and do this intentional connections to an elderly couple who probably won't book you or <laughs> are you specifically <laughs> making those connections with people that look like they could be your future clients so a couple of years ago guys i um watched a video on youtube and of a wedding photographer i think he's from america or whatever said a couple of things and after that video i decided to really change the way I speak to people at weddings and be a bit more outgoing and make friends at weddings. Um, at first, it was awkward for me, even though I'm a very outgoing person and it's easy for me to chat to strangers. I, I've got no issue walking up to a stranger and asking him um, something. But for me, it was a learning thing of you know, getting that balance between uh, stepping over somebody's boundaries, if I can call it that, versus, you know, just being a nice guy and getting to know people. And over time, I guess I learned to become better at it and, and just connect with people easier. And even up to this day, sometimes I just don't connect with people. Um, you get to a wedding. I mean, how many of us have gone to weddings and you think, this is not my ideal client or this is not the person I thought it was or whatever the case, but you still obviously give your best and deliver the goods, but you're not going to do that much effort. And and then getting back to your question, Lindsay, with regards to older people, um, there is sometimes old people, older people <laughs> that I, you know, make fun with and, and joke with them and get to know them. But yes, my focus would be more intentionally on the younger people. It would be it was something simple, just taking a photo of them and see what their reaction is. Are they saying something to you after the photo was taken or do they just say thank you and carry on what they were doing? And you would be surprised at how many people will actually start a conversation with you. I had big jokes on uh, with the whole table uh, two Saturdays ago at my wedding. It just happened that we, oh, what happened was, I took a photo. It was actually quite funny. I took a photo of a couple and then I walked up to them and I showed them the photo, the back of my camera. And as I showed the photo, he sort of put his hand on my camera, his left hand. And when he put his left hand on the camera, I immediately saw that he's got exactly the same wedding band as me. Um, so we started talking and it was so cool. So they are married couple already, but that flowed into the whole table. So then I learned the other guy was a professional golfer and I'm a very big golfer myself. And yeah, it just flowed. And and later on, I sort of got to know everyone else. We didn't exchange numbers. We didn't become Facebook friends or anything. But I know mm -hmm. if they know of someone or want me, they'll contact a the couple, uh, the bride and groom, and ask them for my number. So it happened through that process that sometimes I book nine or ten weddings from a wedding. And you get to, to that wedding and after like seven, eight, nine weddings of the same friend group, if I can call it, uh, that the people know you by now. Say, hey, haven't seen you in a while. How are you doing? And it takes time. I mean, the one 
group of people that I've been photographing for years now, sometimes over seven, eight years. So I photographed the bride and groom like nine, eight years ago and photographing a young couple that was there only now, you know, so it stretches. I think for someone like myself, I feel like it's a very big step to start speaking to people at weddings. I feel that I'm quite introverted. What advice would you give to any photographers who might want to use this technique of yours to actually start speaking to people to step out of the comfort zone and to form connections at weddings? I think it's different for every single person and it really is up to your personality and I don't think you must force it um, because people can very easily see whether you fake or not. For me, it comes naturally. um, And I think at the end of the day, you will find ways. It's like Lindsay said earlier, we have to serve people. So if you don't want to chat to people, then serve people. Uh, I would do something simple like, and instead of telling the bridesmaid that I'm very, I'm very, particular about this because instead of telling the bridesmaids remember to fix the bride's dress um in the front of the church after she walked down the aisle i don't tell them that i do it myself because i want to do it myself because mom goes oh look at the photographer he's fixing your dress (laughs) so it's it's sort of a naughty thing and and that is those are things that you guys can do who, who who do not want to, you know, walk up to people and start chatting to them. Mm. Um, I must say, a lot of times those people actually start chatting to me. Um, they would ask me about my holster in which I put my cameras. I think you're using the shoulder straps, um, Michelle. I haven't seen you shoot, Lindsay, but you've got your leather strap. And sometimes people would come to you and say, oh, wow, I love your your straps for your cameras. It's really cool. And from that point, you can talk. So a lot of times they actually come to you or they come to you and they ask you, can you please take a photo of us? When a couple does that, I don't just take a photo. I make sure I take a decent photo. So I would actually make them walk and say, okay, let's go stand here. Fairy lights in the background if it's in the evening. You know, make sure the background's nice and do a really decent portrait. So I, I go with the extra mile for that photo. Um, and sometimes I'm just on purpose with regards to walking maybe 10 or 15 meters or 20 meters so that they feel I'm doing effort rather than just, okay, stand there, take the photo, and it's done. Um, because then it's a photo and they might be happy with the photo. But if you take them to maybe walk five or 10 meters and say, okay, stand in this spot, suddenly you've done effort um, and they feel special and they feel that you've sort of individually done something for them. Um, So that helps as well. Um, And I must be honest, on a Sunday after a wedding day, until about 10, 11 o'clock, you know, I don't want people around me. I'm like, you know, locked in the room. My wife knows, don't bother me type of thing. It's like I'm really stuffed, but mentally, not not physically, um, because I give everything uh, on a wedding day. And, and if I do back-to-back weddings like a Friday and a Saturday, I can do that. I can even do three in a row. But then after that, I'm like – Truly stuff <laughs> because it mentally, yeah, it, it just absolutely drains you mentally. Um, but it also fuels me at the same time. A while ago, I was sick going to a wedding and I did test the Friday and my test was negative. Um, but then I went to, to the wedding and on my way there, I thought to myself, how am I going to get through this day? And as soon as I picked up my That's camera, amazing. I was like, it was just going. I was like, didn't feel sick for the rest of the day. And even that Sunday, I was fine. Um, so it's like my, it's like the camera just helped me sort of yeah. focus. Yeah, I know. It's it's crazy adrenaline that kicks in when you're – I often think like yeah. – uh, I'm sure it's happened to you as well. You've woken up like the morning of a wedding and you have a stomach bug or something and you're just like, no. <laughs> but somehow it's always yeah, fun. <laughs> So actually, I loved what you said. It's it's actually like a whole mind shift when you approach a wedding day where, yes, the bride and groom are your clients, but you're also viewing all the guests and the family as potential clients as well. And I, I think that changes if 
yeah, if we have that mindset, it also changes the way we respond to people. And mm. maybe Uncle Bob with For the sure. camera is a little bit less annoying because, you know, we, he could be a client or, you know, we, yeah, yes. I think it's, it's, it's a good, good mindset. And um, so we wanted to move on to our reoccurring segment, which is called Expandagram. And in this section, we take a photo from each of our Instagram accounts and we just expand on what was happening. We want to hear behind the scenes, what was happening, what was your state of mind, um, what was the couple's, just any little extra info on, on that image. And so um, for our listeners at home and people that aren't on the YouTube channel, we will put this in a slider on our Instagram, so you'll be able to have a look through each of the photos um, and yeah, see which ones we're talking about. But for, for now, Kobus, do you want to kick us off uh, explaining the photo that you're going to talk about? So, Linda, I've always wanted to shoot in a desert, whether it's Dubai or Namibia or anything like that, and photograph a bride and groom, uh, you know, on a dune and so on. So, in um, Arniston uh, or Barnes Grants in in the Western Cape, there's a place where there's quite a big dune. And most of the time, that dune is quite round. But if you catch it in a dry season and there was quite a bit of wind, it starts to look like an actual desert dune. Um, and it doesn't happen often. And the other problem with that specific location is that most of the time, there's so many footsteps on it. So it's never like a, a pure, like beautiful dune. And... Um, on that day, it was quite a cold day, uh, but the couple was quite, they were troopers, uh, so it was great. And the wind was blowing, and it's quite a bit of a walk up there. And I said to them, are you keen? We'll get, we can see what's happening up there. But what's nice, and I tried to motivate them because I saw that the, the light is going to be very nice. And that something I learned through my landscape photography days is to be able to read and determine whether there's something is going to happen. And I asked them to, to walk with me up there because I also told them that the dunes have sharp edges. And that's the one thing I've always wanted is sharp edge dunes like in the desert. So we went up there and um, I've got another photo where I first photographed the bride standing on the dune. And then later on, I added the groom and it was taken with a Canon 5D Mark IV and a 135 mil lens. I was standing quite far away, um, and with a 135 mil f2, it compressed everything. And like you can see, that's the image that came from it. Cool. Thank you so much, Corbus. That's awesome. Our last question, rounding off the podcast, is Corbus. We just want to know what's one thing that you wish you knew when you were starting out as a photographer. One piece of advice you'd give your younger self. Um, to invest way more time to get to know the business of photography rather than just becoming a better photographer. If I knew nine years ago what I know today with regards to the business and networking and everything that goes with the business side of things, um, I think I would have been quite a few steps ahead of myself now. But at least I learned it eventually. They say never look back, um, and I don't. I'm very grateful for the road I've walked and and still walking and will continue to walk for at least another 10 years. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it is amazing to, to look back and see the knowledge and, and, and wisdom I've, you know, received over a period of 10, 10 years. But if there's any photographer out there starting right now, um, I would say in, invest more time on the business side of things and getting skills with regards to that, whether it is to be able to design things um, like adverts and stuff, learning how to advertise your business on social media, um, whether it is whatever case. Um, but learn the business side of things way more than um, the photography side of things. That's great. And the great thing for, for us and listeners is that you can learn directly from Kobus as well. Um, Kobus, last little thing. Will you just tell us where we can find your <laughs> online education um, 
yeah, what sort of platforms can we find you on there? Uh, thank you for the opportunity, Lindsay. Um, well, I've got basically my main Instagram account is Kubis Tolach, um, photography. And then I've got another Instagram account, which is photographer specifically. It's called Learn with Kubis Tolach. Um, on Instagram, and then I also have a YouTube channel called Kubis Tolach, and you're welcome to check that out. Um, love to have awesome. you. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us. It's a big, big pleasure, and thank you, guys. Yeah, it was an honor to have you on here. Thank you for sharing your knowledge. I feel like anyone who listens to this would be able to get so much from you. So, yeah, just from us and from all our listeners, thank you so much for joining. We really appreciate you. And, yeah, to all our listeners, please, please, please go follow Kubis. You will not regret it. He's awesome, and you can learn so much from him. Thank you, guys. I really, really appreciate it. And um, I look forward to seeing where this podcast is growing and um, where it's going to be in a year from now. I think you guys are going to kill it. And um, all the best to you too. And also for your individual businesses as well. Good luck for the wedding season starting now in, in, in uh, South Africa. And I look forward to seeing your pictures. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode of the Gold and Hard Wedding Photography Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to stay up to date with all our future podcasts. You can find us on Spotify, YouTube, and Instagram as the Golden Heart Podcast. Thanks for joining. Bye.